Mom, Dad, I humbly suggest you save some money and shop Amazon for back to school. It's for my growth, meaning my body's growing at an alarming rate. And clothes you buy me this year will be very small very soon. Plus, the clothes I love today will be out of style tomorrow. But at least your wallet doesn't have to be my fashion victim if you shop low prices for school at Amazon. Hopefully this is helpful. Amazon. Spend less, smile more. Welcome to Saturday Story Circle, always on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated G for general audience. Hail and well met. I'm guessing you're wanting shelter from the storm, right? Well, it is a cold night out there. Why don't you pull up a chair by the fire? I have just the thing to pass the time. A story. I call it Forbidden. Welcome to the Lavender Tavern, my friend. When Fredegar came into their chambers, Roland smiled up at him and continued knitting. "'Will you come to bed now?' Fredegar asked in his booming voice, slipping off his tunic, a tunic that Roland had knitted of Royal Navy wool. "'Not yet,' Roland replied. He had a light musical voice. "'I have some knitting to do.' Fredegar pulled back the blanket from the bed, a green and white blanket that Roland had also knitted. Roland saw the smallest pout on Fredegar's lips and knew that he wished him to come to bed but also that he was only required to join Fredegar in bed once a week, as per their marriage contract. Try to be quieter with those things, Fredegar said gruffly, slipping between the blanket and the sheets. He gestured at Roland's bone knitting needles. They could not be any quieter. Roland had practised and practised over the months, finding ways to keep the needles from clicking against each other, sliding them over the loops of yarn instead of tapping against each other. If he was careful, they were silent. They had to be. Fredegar began to snore, and then Roland was alone in their chambers with a candle and his knitting. He watched Fredegar sleep, wondering when he would be able to leave the room, when it would be safe. But he continued knitting regardless. He needed to use as much wool as he could. There was a tapestry on the wall, Fredegar in battle. Roland did not know how to weave, but he had knitted the different areas of colour, then stitched them together to form a type of mosaic. Proud, brave, strong, fearless Fredegar. And then the man sleeping beneath it, mouth open, arms spread limp. It was time. Roland put down the knitting needles and left the chambers, carrying the candle. He went through the hall, then down the tight curved stairs to the basement. The black door was to his left. He pretended to ignore it, pretended it was not there. Instead, Roland turned to his right and went over to the one possession he had brought with him from his small village one year ago, when Fredegar had come to demand his hand in marriage. The spinning wheel had been passed down through his family, from his grandparents to his parents and now to him. If he kept it oiled regularly with flaxseed oil, it was as silent as his knitting needles. Roland placed the candle on the floor and sat on the low stool. Thankfully, there was still enough wool to last him for tonight. He would have to ask Fredegar for more wool soon. Fredegar's estate did not keep sheep, and he would have to trade grain for it, but Roland had told him that this was all he knew how to do, and Fredegar wanted to keep him happy. Or at least to keep him occupied. Roland took a piece of spare yarn and tied it to the bobbin. Then he passed the other end through the bobbin's hole and made sure it spun freely. He gathered the free end of the wool and started to twist it in his nimble fingers until it was as thin as the yarn. Then he tied the wool to the yarn and he was ready. He used his feet to push the treadle up and down rhythmically as he narrowed the wool with his fingers. It spun around the wheel and collected his yarn upon the bobbin. Roland spun and spun, and he waited for it to happen. 
Just as the spinning wheel and the skill of spinning had been passed down through his family, so had the ability of second sight. His brother did not have it, but Roland did, for better or worse. The talent. An image formed in the flickering spokes of the wheel. It was Wenny. Roland smiled. Wenny was his favourite of the other three, though he would never admit to it. She was from a humble background as well. While normally she looked drawn and upset, she was smiling, holding a cooking spoon in her hand. It was still light wherever she was, and the sun illuminated her golden hair. Roland, she said happily, and her voice whispered through the spokes like wind through the leaves. I have news. Tell me, Roland whispered back. But Wenny shook her head. She wanted to wait for the others to arrive, and so he spun and spun, and she stirred and stirred, and they waited. Miraline was the next to arrive. A severe woman with brown skin and long black hair, she sat in the dawning sun with her sorceress's cloak gathered around her. Of course it was dawn there, he thought. She could never join them at night. Then there was only one more to await. Christia was late. She was always late. Roland worried that she might not show at all, but finally her image joined that of Wenny and Miraline, and their circle was complete. The circle of the spinning wheel, Roland thought. Of course, that was inaccurate. They each had the talent, but they each had their own way of using it. Miraline, who could read books, had told them once what the scholars called their abilities. His was cyclomancy, divination using a wheel that spun. Wenny peered into the boiling water of the pot over her stove and saw them among the bubbles. This was hydromancy. Miraline, as was fitting, used the flames of her hearth fire to communicate with them. Pyromancy. And Christia? Christia, the elegant lady of the castle, used a mirror, of course. Captromancy. Roland had not planned to meet any of them at first. He had not been searching for them, and he had never had any success at his talent, until he had been forced by his villagers' chieftain to marry Fredegar, forced to move into Fredegar's manor, and forced to live by his side. Perhaps he had wished to meet them? Like attracts like, as Miraline had also told them, and certainly they all had the same hopes, and the same fears. Wenny was the first to speak. It's done, she said. It's over. She shook her head. The locket, it was only a test. Miraline shrugged. Why would your stepmother give you a locket as a test? When he leaned forward confidentially, she wanted to ensure that I was worthy of marrying her nephew. His name is Tira. If I could hold the locket for a month without opening it, then she would know I could follow instruction, and that her nephew and I would care for her properly. Christian sniffed. From one type of slavery to another, I do not approve. Well, it's not slavery, Wenny said. It's a marriage. Roland thought that Wenny had a great deal to learn about marriage, but she went on. Tira and I shall be happy together. Did you find out what was in the locket? Roland asked. A spell? A charm? At the end of the thirty days, Wenny said, she opened it for me. It was a lock of her hair, nothing more. A spell using that hair would have been enough to choke you in your sleep, Miraline said, had you been foolish enough to open the locket. He could see that Wenny was not listening. She was relieved. Of course she was relieved. I suppose I must leave the circle now, she said, and smiled yet again. Roland looked at Christian and Miraline's flickering images and imagined that they felt what he felt. It was a relief for Wenny to be done with the ordeal, but they would miss her too. Good luck, he offered. Wenny's image was fading in the candlelight. I will think of you, she said, and then she was gone. Now they were three. There had been others in the past, always women. Roland thought that there was something about this type of ordeal that seemed to involve women. He was a rare exception. Miraline's image straightened in her chair. Then I shall speak next. She looked to her left. From earlier gatherings, Roland knew that her bed was on that side of the hearth fire. Of late, I can only sleep a few hours, she said. I cannot sleep from dusk until dawn. Have you tried the usual potions? Christia asked. As a lady, such things would no doubt be available to her, Roland thought. Miraline scoffed. All the potions you may imagine, and then many more. I can only sleep eight hours, nine at the most, if I take a great deal of exercise during the day. She drew her cloak closer around her. I hear strange noises while I lie in bed, and I worry that I will open my eyes during the night. 
Just as Wenny had been forbidden to open her stepmother's locket, Miraline was forbidden to open her eyes between sundown and sunup. Roland looked at the yarn accumulating on the wheel's bobbin and a thought came to him. Could you use a scarf? he asked. Could you tie one around your head to prevent you from seeing whatever appears in your room at night? Miraline lifted her hand and a length of black cloth came into view. I am already doing this, she said. If my eyes were to open beneath this cloth, I am unsure as to whether that would contravene the spirit of the request. The request. It was not a request. Not for any of them. They were forbidden. Roland thought of the black door on the other side of the room. The door was cold and slimy to the touch, and he shuddered. Perhaps the word request made it easier for Miraline to accept the ordeal. He never thought of Fredegar's demands as requests. She went on. This is what I cannot abide. Not simply the nature of the request, that is bad enough. Not simply that there is something I am forbidden to witness, but that the rules of this request are so very unclear. Miraline said nothing more, brooding and clearly lost within her thoughts. Roland had suggested the scarf, but it was an obvious suggestion, and he had nothing more to say and knew not how to comfort her. Christian did not even try. Then it's my turn, Christian said. She had delicate features and wore a henin, a tall conical hat. Roland had seen drawings of princesses with henins before, but he could not imagine why Christian would wear such a thing in her chambers, unless it was to impress Wenny and Miraline and himself. The elders came by yet again to warn me not to go into the forest, she said, and laughed, a short, unpleasant laugh. I suppose I have the simplest task of the three of us. All I need to do is stay far away from that forest. She leaned forward until Roland imagined her nose was nearly touching her mirror. And yet I do not wish to visit the forest. I do not care for the forest. I have never been to a forest, and the idea does not interest me. She tilted her head down and composed herself. Perhaps it is a snake which eats its own tail. Roland was confused, and he could see that Miraline did not understand as well. Christia put her hands in her lap and looked at them in irritation. You do not read stories, either of you. I do not wish to go into the forest, but in such a story I would end up going to the forest regardless, for some reason. This is the snake that eats its tail, to be compelled to do something you do not wish to do. She sighed. Or perhaps it would drive me mad, not to know what lies within the forest. Madness does run in our family, much as the talent does. He bent down to look at the wool and make sure there was yet enough left to spin. Roland had tried to use the talent of the spinning wheel on its own, but it would not conjure up any images without wool to spin. There was no madness in his family, Roland thought. No. The madness lay in Fredegar's mind, in his words and battles and conquests, and in the cold black door at the end of the room. How are you faring, Roland? Christian asked, snapping him out of his reverie. Roland nodded. I am glad that when he has come to the end of her tale, he said, it shows us that not all that is forbidden is necessarily bad. He let the wool pass over his fingers for a few seconds as he thought. Perhaps it is only breaking the rule that has been set for us which is bad, not the locket or the forest or the night. Or the door, he thought. But whatever was behind the door was surely worse than a locket. Roland thought sometimes he could smell blood and sulphur behind it. Why do you not simply leave him? Miraline asked. He admired her mind. It ran like a direct line like his. Well, I cannot, Roland replied simply. The village chieftain has entered into a contract with him. It was a relief not to have to speak Fredegar's name. He will not attack the village so long as I remain here. I stay or I condemn my village and myself. It was Christian's turn. Do you believe that he wishes to... hurt you? She asked, surprisingly circumspect. I do not know. Though he speaks terrible words to others, he is warm and loving to me. But who would forbid someone to do something, without exception, without explanation, unless there was a terrible secret to be discovered? They were all silent a moment. Then Christian turned from her mirror. Oh, someone is coming up the stairs to my chambers, she whispered to them. I, I must go. Let us adjourn for tonight, Miraline added. Until next week. Until next week, Roland said, and Christian repeated the words. 
The images in the spokes of the wheels faded, and Roland took his feet from the treadle. He cut the end of the yarn with a knife and tied the bobbin off, and then Roland stood and went over to the black door and contemplated it. This was not a story of a snake who ate its own tail. This was not a story of a snake at all, he thought. The door did not matter. Neither did the locket or the terrors that came at night or the forest. What mattered was that someone, husband, stepmother, elders or sorcery council, had placed so important a choice in front of them when it was not their place or right to do so. He put his hand on the ice-cold latch of the door just for a moment. And then Roland turned away. He would not give Fredegar that power. Opening the door, not opening the door, anything he would do that involved the door meant giving up some of his own power. There was another direction he could go. The next morning, as Roland sat at the spinning wheel in the basement, Fredegar came down the stairs, dressed in his battle armour. Have you opened that door? he asked, pointing to the black door, as if Roland needed to be reminded of it. How many times had he asked him if he had opened the door? And how many times had he replied, No, of course not. This time, Roland said nothing. With the faintest of smiles, he let the wool pass through his fingers, narrowing it into yarn. He concentrated on the wheel. If he willed it, there was no door, and there was no Fredegar. Only the wheel and the wool and the yarn, spinning and spinning. Hey, you must be new. Welcome to the Lavender Tavern. Come on in and warm up. How'd you find the place? Well, I got a mysterious letter from the barkeep about a week before I even knew I was setting off on an adventure. Ah, those directions. They never fail. If you go far enough in one direction, past the point where you would normally stop, and then keep going, sooner or later you'll see the lamp in the window. Don't stop. Don't let the sleet and the wind and the snow sinking beneath your feet stop you. Just a few steps more, you're almost there. <laughs> Always sends chills down my spine. I didn't exactly have time to follow those directions, though. Once I knew the tavern was out there... Wait, then how did you get here? The barkeep listed the tavern on Little Business Library. It made it so much easier to find. I just clicked the name, the Lavender Tavern, on my friend's magical tablet, and ta-da! It took me here instantly. And no spirits were attached to you in the process? Nothing that's going to steal from the gold coins you pay your tab with? None whatsoever. See? Check me. No percentage taking malevolent spirits at all. All the coin I spend will go directly to the barkeep. Look it up for yourself. You can find it through the geographic listing searches under indeterminate dimension. Huh. But what does he do with all that coin he gets anyhow? I mean, the fog machines around this place alone have to rack up quite a bill. Visit Little Business Library at littlebusinesslibrary.com. Follow them on Twitter at at littlebusinesses or find them on Facebook and Instagram. When you join the library, don't forget to use Listen10 at checkout to receive a discount on the membership fee. The Gods Above the Table A world of millions sat upon the wooden table, and Gladwin and Alar stood above it. These millions of tiny constructs were not real people. As was their custom every week after the Sabbath, the two men conjured up a world of miniature simulacra, scurrying to and fro in a tiny version of the world, and played a game. They played at being gods. Fifty years ago, they would have been drawn and quartered for their heresy. Twenty-five years ago, it would have been considered in poor taste. Even five years ago, they would hesitate before discussing it with strangers. But now it was a game. A jest. Gladwin, the more nervous of the two, nibbled his thumbnail and studied the world spread out below him like a living map. You block me. You block me yet again. Alar, older and more mature, laughed. You 
build your belief system and your worship on such foolish premises. How can I help but block you? The religion Gladwin had created for this evening's game was one of enlightenment, self-actualization, and equality between all men, women, and others. He used these first principles most weeks, and most weeks he lost. With a pointed finger, Gladwin inspired a tiny cleric to deliver a passionate sermon denouncing those who would demonise the other. He watched as colours rippled across the world below him, reflecting the changes in belief, in support and in the strength of his religion. Then he sighed. You use this old gambit yet again, Alar said. I should have thought after my crusades last week you would know better. He grinned. Let me show you what a master may do with the same idea. With his finger pointed towards one of his shrines, Alar nudged a speck of a priest to convince a woman of government to become a woman of God. The woman gained power, then spoke faint, fiery words. All shall be equal, and all shall be united against the outsiders, against the heathens, against Gladwin's religion. Again the rippling of colours, the shifting of boundaries and beliefs. Gladwin sat back. I am now unable to play my turn, he said. There is no longer enough core belief to say my religion, and so they, my followers, shall use to yours. Again. He shook his head. I do not understand this. Alar cleared the board with a snap of his fingers, and they took a minute to gather their ales from the sideboard. What do you not understand, sweet Gladwin? Fear? Hatred? A blunt strategy will always succeed. My religion had a single point of control, the person at the very top. Yours had no control at all, only voluntary association and mutual respect. He took a long draught and smacked his lips. A religion is akin to a fire. Only one that can withstand rain and wind will spread across a land. Gladwin sipped his ale, which was now losing its chill after a long night's play. We live in an enlightened world of reason, a world where magic follows certain rules, where we know that gods and demons and banshees do not exist. A world of equality and peace. He gestured at the bare wooden table. And yet my gambit always fails. Alar watched him without saying anything. Both of our religions ought to have prospered, Gladwin mused. That is not how the game is played. Consider this. You and I were the gods of this world. We did exist. We were watching them. We intervened when we could, and their fates were of consequence to us. How could my religion, which was based on a god that actually existed, fail? Gladwin's face was dark. Perhaps there is a fault in the game. Alar waved a hand. That is your usual recourse. Whenever you cannot win, you accuse the game of being unfair. We should be able to intervene more directly, Gladwin said. The rules are quite clear, Alar said, patience wearing thin in his voice. No miracles, no divine intervention. He leaned over the table towards Gladwin. This game is just as our world is. We have no miracles or divine intervention here. Why should they? It is an unfair rule, Gladwin replied. All we have are these indirect methods, persuasion, inspiration. If our little men and women were truly intelligent, they should see the hidden hands above the board guiding them towards our desired goals. The ale was finished, and Alar stood to leave, a sign that the evening was over. He kissed the younger man goodnight. I tell you this, Alar said at the door. Were there gods truly watching over us? No doubt we would quickly see through such manipulation. Indeed, Gladwin said, nodding. Were there gods watching over us? Ah, look at that. The storm is settling and you are free to go. Of course, you're always welcome to sit by the fire and stay a while. There are many more nights, and many more stories. Tonight's story was told by Ben Meredith. You can also find him in the Magnus Archives, Rusty Quill Gaiman, the Brothers Meredith, and Stellar Firma. Find our credits, merch, and more stories at LavenderTavern.com. Interested in having your short story told at the Lavender Tavern? Submit a copy of your writing to us at www 
www.faustiannonsense.com slash Lavender Tavern Submissions. The Lavender Tavern is written by Jonathan Cohen, whom you can follow on Twitter at at LavTavPodcast for updates and more content. If you want a huge selection of audio drama, some of the newest ones out there as they come out, then do find Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network, which is the new home of the Sonic Society, the world's longest-running, largest showcase of modern audio drama. You can find us on the Sunday Showcase feed, or if you want to hear all of the day's worth of audio, then you can find it on the main Mutual Audio Network feed, wherever you get your podcasts. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.